Well done. Okay, so from Dallas. We now go to Buenos Aires. You know, number five. With one mighty leap to Buenos Aires. Yes, straight down to, um, to a store called Mercer, which is um, a quirky fashion brand. And it's, it's a lovely era um, of Buenos Aires, a lot of high-end brands. But this really stood out because it's, uh, it was an old garage um, that you can see from the, the, the huge lighting raft that literally cars were coming here to be mended. But what they've done is taken over, they've bought a simple product line, and they've created crazy wallpaper um, with a mixture of fans, rugs, antiquated furniture, but the way they've mixed it together, it's seamless and it feels like a genuine um, new environment. And as we look through it, I can completely see where American um, Abercrombie and Fitch sorry, got cues from. This yes, is it does, where, it does look um, very this is the original. Abercrombie and Fitch, isn't it? This, yeah. yeah. It's bright and light as, as opposed to Abercrombie and Fitch, but here I think they were very much the pioneers in this sort of uh, uh, reclaimed um, Reclaim materials and um, fixtures and fittings, and it, they, they were the originators of the idea. But do you think this type of concept is scalable? I think this particularly would work very well in department stores. I can see this working um, well as um, in, in House of Fraser, other big department stores around the world, where you've got a set area that you can bring in a few cues, be it a chair um, or, or, or be it a, a wardrobe with um, the, uh, the iconic wallpaper. So, yeah, I think, I, think it, I think it is to a point, but we, I don't think there's enough product range at this stage to make this um, a standalone store. Yeah, but it does look very thin on product. It is. Um, and I, I'd be curious to understand the economics of the store, which actually is that thin on product. Lots of must-have items that, uh, that change every week, but it's a, it, it's a very standard wardrobe. I mean, it's expensive stuff, so that, that, that also should give you a cue of, uh, of how it manages to make uh, Great, so from, uh, from Latin America to... Go to Hong Kong. So number four, we have um, a great department store retailer, and that's Lane Crawford. This is their new concept in the IF um, Mall. Uh, what's so intriguing about this is, is the way that you seamlessly walk from one department to another. There's not that awkward, jerky action from home to fashion. It's just a seamless, continuous shopping journey. And the way they've managed to do that is through... Um, product integration um, so that you get the transition, but also by using um, props and walls that without walls, if that makes sense. So they use a lot of dividers as opposed to clear block walls, so you still get a feeling of airiness and it's a, a really premium mall with a lot of great services and offers. And, and does that type of style actually make you want to explore the store more? Absolutely. I mean, every corner you turn, you sort of you're intrigued to go to the next, and there's some brilliant. Um, I mean, mannequins there are, are, are very special. They spend a lot of money and, uh, and time on getting very stylized mannequins. There's a lot of horse mannequins, which is a new one, but that ties into the, um, the Japanese um, Feng Shui um, ethos that it's got to feel right, and that's a symbol of uh, of calmness and shopping. Oh, oh, I must say, I always have this thing with mannequins. You know, like you, I travel a lot, and I always find that as soon as I start to find the mannequins attractive, it's uh, a sure sign it's such a time to start to feel better. <laughs> I'm sure you're not alone. I'm sure I've got people that think as well. Of course, Lane and Crawford's really interesting in itself because I mean, this is a you know, this is a, a really interesting, very modern look, looking store. But of course, Lane and Crawford um, started up in Hong Kong in I think it must be a, a, in the 1850s. Um, with two Scottish uh, friends who uh, came out to Hong Kong and, and uh, developed the store format, and it's been everything. You know, like a typical sort of department store. You know, it used to uh, used to be an auctioneer, it used to sell fine fragrances, it used to do a load of different things, um, and had to completely reinvent itself um, after um, the Second World War and really start again. And I think it's done a, a tremendous job of uh, of reinvention over a number of different different periods. Um, uh, and if, uh, if uh, any of you get a chance to get out, out to Hong Kong, it's definitely worthwhile seeing both this particular store at the Pacific Place, but also their store at the IFC Mall, um, which uh, is, I think, a masterclass in, uh, in retail concept and retail design. It also has some sensational views uh, across Hong Kong Harbour, not to be missed. It does, and I think the great thing about this store that is very different to a lot of the department stores features seen around the world, uh, and that is the fact that every single department has a concierge service. So there is somebody to help guide and navigate the beauty department or fashion, and they bring that 
service proposition to life and make it a centre stage in store as opposed to it being hidden. And that's the sort of thing we're seeing Topshop um, sort of learn elements and, and make it replicable for their um, value sector. And I think that's a really interesting point there because uh, a lot of these concepts that you, know, you see around the world um, may not be scalable. Um, we talked about the store in Buenos Aires. Um, but there are individual elements that you can pick out of those stores and, and combine into a scalable, scalable concept. And we sometimes forget that when we look at stores, thinking, well, actually, how can all of this store translate into our particular markets? But uh, sometimes it's, it's one or two elements uh, and developing and bringing those across and augmenting that to an uh, already existing store proposition um, that makes a very unique concept. Definitely, and that's why Fitch believes I think there's no substitute for first hand experience. Uh, and learnings, I mean, even something, a great idea poorly executed is a great learning we can take uh, and advise with the client. And the other thing is that I think by seeing the spectrum of different retailers, everybody's dealing with similar issues as a retailer and you can cherry pick the best of ideas uh, and, and help uh, in a different sector. Okay, so from the 24 hour chaos of Hong Kong, where do we go to next? The chaos, and we're going from a premium to a completely different um, value issue here. We're looking at FMCG brands turning into retailers. This is a new trend, but one being led by um, P&G, and it's in their hometown of Cincinnati. It's Mr. Clean at number three. So here we have um, a, a product that was struggling to get shelf space and attention in the likes of Walmart, and it seems to just lack um, experience or value. Uh, so what they did is create a standalone version, which was a car wash dedicated to using all the products from the Mr. Clean range. And it's been very successful. They're, they're hoping to roll out another 14 this year, and I believe it was um, changed their ages um, store of the year last year as well. And, and is there anything about the actual experience itself that uh, is different? You have you have two elements. You have the outside cleaning where um, Mr. Clean staff will clean your car, um, and so it's sort of uh, a trained staff and a brand that's really understood that you have to have. Um, the, the right people to do, do the right job. But then when you go inside, you can also see your car being washed, you can sit down, have a coffee, watch TV. So there's also a small grocery convenience section there. So you've got, um, you've got two elements to it. I thought there was also an opportunity for, if you, you know, for the kids to actually start to direct some of the jets at certain parts in the car as well. So there's a, a little bit about interactivity in the experience. Yes. Okay, so uh, now we're clean, where do we go to from there? We now jump to uh, Mumbai, and uh, at number two we have Asian Paints. It's actually uh, one of our projects, and what was great about this is, and particularly for, for the climate of today, this is a flagship store by a paint manufacturer that you can't actually buy anything in. Now the reason being, and I think um, a, a lot of what makes all these examples great, is they come from a clear consumer need. The consumer need here in Mumbai was that uh, the Indian consumer doesn't feel particularly confident or knowledgeable about painting and decorating, they've always got someone else to do it. But as things change, they want to take an involvement in, in home interiors and decoration. So this is a flagship store that allows you to understand colour, the choice of lighting, and then, with, armed with that knowledge, you will then go and hopefully buy um, an Asian paint product at one of the 3,000 outlets around, uh, around India. Now, many people might not have heard of Asia's. Asia paints, but they are the well, they are the leading paint uh, brand and manufacturer in India, and I think the third largest paint manufacturer in the world. So they are a, a large, huge company, and I think it really is good that uh, a company of that type of stature really understands that uh, one of the things that they need to do is to inspire the consumers in terms of what they can actually do with colour and how to use colour, because um, I think consumers right away across the world are relatively scared and apprehensive about. Uh, colour and how to mix colour and how to mix colours uh, together uh, in order to make sure they actually work. So a store environment like this I think does a really, really good job in giving consumers confidence to be bolder and to experiment. This is definitely uh, from a brand retailer's point of view, a leap of faith and it's one that it was a hard fought journey but I, I think you know they're very, very pleased that the sales stack up for themselves but I think especially in this climate um, you can't stop still with retail innovation. In fact now is a great time not to, uh, to cut the budget and spend in terms of uh, new formats or, or retail innovation, but to actually increase it so that at the end of this, you'll come out better and stronger and with a more differentiated retail offer. Well, I think one of the things that's absolutely true about the environment we're currently in at the moment is, is it will end. I think it will end and we'll all be in a slightly different place than we were before we went into uh, this recession. 
Uh, but I think uh, it's very important for retailers and manufacturers around the world not to take their foot off uh, the innovation lever and the innovation pedal. Um, because in order to stimulate consumers to, uh, to, to buy new products and services, especially um, when they're under financial pressure, uh, consumers really need a very good reason to part with their money and clearly innovation um, is an important element of that. So we're almost at the end. And I suppose everybody is uh, wondering what number one is going to be. You know, what, uh, what is, it? is it going to be a, a very old concept or is it going to be a very new concept? So what's, uh, Matt, what's your number one? I have to say it's also a very personal opinion uh, because it's, uh, it's actually La Boqueria Market in Barcelona. Um, I just find this place fascinating every time um, we, we go and visit. I think for a number of reasons. Well, I mean, that's really old because I think it's probably started off in the 17th century. It, it, it's the fact that the store owners take so much pride in their product and, and the visual merchandising. I think some of the supermarkets anywhere in the world can learn from the visual merchandising cues as well as fashion retailers. I think from a, a hospitality and leisure point of view, it's a great place to interact, to learn, to socialise and to taste great fresh food. So I always feel energised here and I think there's a, a, a lot of great, um, great learnings from, from all over, from colour blocking to simple graphics um, to high level signage, all the way through to a, a fun leisure experience which retail is always, you know, retail and shopping is the purpose of life and this, no, matter, no more than anywhere, is where it's pretty personified. I think uh, you, can't, you can't beat markets, can you, with, uh, with all the... Uh um, sort of uh, innovation that goes into some sort of uh, covered stores. Uh, when you, you get to a really, really good market um, with uh, fantastic uh, owners who really understand merchandise and merchandising and how to sell and how to communicate with customers, um, it, nine times out of ten is a phenomenal sort of masterclass in, in, in retail, isn't it? Definitely. Uh, and this is you know, just real retail at its best. And I think the other thing here, in, in terms of its longevity, uh, it's really proved itself evolving with the times, both in, in, in the products that it offers and the way it offers. So it's about timing, product, place, and all of those things that are, are the hallmarks of, of, of retail. And that's why it will continue, hopefully, for another 100 years and will be very different, but at the same time, keep a lot of uh, the great qualities it has now. Well, thanks very much for listening and watching, and we look forward to seeing you next time. So from all of us at the store and the WPP, thank you very much indeed, and thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you.